Um, the funny thing is, is that on the day that I say I may not be broadcasting uh, because I'm not feeling 100%, I'm actually pretty much on time. So sorry, I'm a little uh, winded just because I've been running all around. <clears throat> so uh, I hope you're all doing well. I, like I said, I'm not sort of making it up when I say I'm not feeling 100%, but there are two big reasons why I'd like to do... Um, why I would like to do Old World tonight. Um, one of them is Old World's quite fun, and, you know, I was kind of wanting to play it tonight, and I sort of think that maybe, you know, it's whenever you're streaming, you're going to have to focus your attention. It's a little bit like work, and I did have, like, a a full day at work today, so I'm, I'm definitely feeling the effects. Um, but... I don't know, like, it's it's the only gaming I'm going to get done uh, between now and Wednesday, I think. So, um, Old World's just a really wonderful game, and I'd, I'd like to play some more of it. Having said that, let's get the disclosure out of the way. So, um, I was given a copy of the game uh, from Hooded Horse for the purposes of, um, of promoting the game. Uh, this was coinciding with the Heroes of the Aegean and Steam release for Old World. I had played it before on uh, Epic, um, but... Uh, any case, it's one of these things to uh, to disclose, which I have now done. So I'll probably say that uh, as the attendance uh, hops up a little bit. <clears throat> we will jump into the game as well. I just wanted to um, get a couple of details out of the way because there was another thing that I thought was kind of funny when I loaded up the, um, the stream, and that is apparently Hegel is trending. Oh, no, I just closed it. Wait, why isn't Hegel here anymore? <laughs> I have a feeling what's been going on here is, um, <clears throat> well, there's always a risk in showing showing you the, uh, <laughs> thank you, Algrins, uh, and thank you for your, your nice words um, about, uh, about not... Uh, not broadcasting. I have a couple of ideas about how to try and make this, you know, balance out for me. Um, but yeah, so I have a bit of a theory in terms of why some of this stuff is coming up. Again, it, it's an absolute, um, <laughs> it's a the huge danger to to show my uh, my Twitter feed um, live on broadcast. But um, <clears throat> but I noticed on the um, the what's happening, Hegel. As soon as I I started the stream, Hegel is in it. I'm like. Stata came up once, Hegel this time, uh, Nietzsche showed up uh, once as well. So I figured let's let's take a quick look and see what's uh, what's up. So uh, Amdi Thelemon says, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Uh, this week's edition of Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour features a discussion with Henry, Harry, Henry Summers Hall on Deleuze's difference and repetition in the wake of Hegel and German idealism, have a listen and a great week. Well, <laughs> I don't. Something tells me Old World's going to be a little bit better for for recharging my batteries. Blue Maga is tre trending. Makes sense. Weird uh, AI or possibly Al. Um, nice. Freaking Hegel. What? Well, apparently, um, apparently. Uh, um, we're in the same uh, same match in in uh, Twitter's algorithm. Would you be interested in joining my club of junior philosophers? My plate's kind of full. I know what you're thinking. We read everything, but no Hegel, if that's your concern. I don't know what movie this is referencing in, but <clears throat> um, a distillation of the difference between Hegel and Marx as posters. I'm not reading all of that. Is that a reference to? <laughs> yeah, it's Beatles references. So yes, we need to take this up. I'm not making this up. The intellectual guru behind Brazil's presidents thinks the songs of the Beatles were actually written by a German philosopher as part of a Marxist plot. I'm going to hold your Hegel while Marx uh, guitar gently weeps. Can't buy me love. Okay, can't buy me love is... I, I realize the can't joke like always gets uh, made, but that is actually a good one. Okay, that's not as interesting as I kind of thought it would be, but um, 
I had to, I had to try. I have not read uh, the phenomenology of spirit. Uh, I wanted to, I think it's lectures of on aesthetics is available in the Penguin edition. I wanted to read that at some point, <clears throat> but uh, the opportunity closed. Can't buy me love is really really good. yeah. It's I mean it's it, uh, if you've ever seen Hedwig and the Angry Inch, um, there's uh, a similar joke as well, and I, I sort of feel like. Actually, I think philosopher comments very specifically put. Let me just take a look and see if I can find this. This is very tangentially related to, um, sorry, existential comics. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, this is only very tangentially related to uh, Old World, so I will hop into the game. But uh, 3,212 days without a can't, can't pun. So, and apparently this is, I'm assuming this is Marx? It definitely looks like the way they draw Marx here. Um, you know what? I can read this on my own. Um, but yeah, anyways. Um, so my suspicion in terms of what's happening here, like I don't know how much of this stuff has been driven by the acquisition talk. But it does feel like, I mean, the thing is, is that the conditions under which the acquisition would have happened are also the conditions under which they're going to want to do these kinds of rollouts anyway. Um, for those of you who have lives, you may not realize that Twitter has actually, in its for its lifetime, if you made more money than you spent last year, you have actually made more money than Twitter has made over its lifetime. I'm talking about income, of course, revenue. Twitter has made a, a very considerable amount of money. But <clears throat> the thing is, is that all of the money that's been put into that, uh, into that platform, all the money that they've spent and borrowed and, you know, gotten through equity and, and what have you, <clears throat> they still haven't paid it back in terms of the amount of money that's been made on the platform. And I think the last quarter they had lost revenues. And of course, everybody is still scrambling after Apple sort of change the the way advertising works. Uh, I'm very happy about this, by the way, but I realize a lot of people have um, been very inconvenienced by this. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is, is that, you know, w one of two things happens. Either you get uh, acquired, um, which, you know, essentially happened with Activision Blizzard, uh, or you sort of convince people that you, you know, you have a good plan for turning things around and you, you know, you sort of retain your independence and you, you work your way out. I suppose the third option is, you know, you just sort of collapse, uh, in, and it all falls apart. But I don't know. I feel like people usually acquire, like the, the tricky part is there's a game that you can play where it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll just wait for them to go bankrupt and then we'll get the, the assets in a fire sale. The thing is, is like everybody else who wants those assets is sort of thinking of the same thing. And so this, of course, gives the reason for why someone would do an acquisition instead. Um, and I was going to talk about some of the EA stuff, but honestly, this is very dull. <laughs> so I will uh, hop in anyway. But yeah, I was going to say, I've noticed that there's a few more sort of customized to me uh, hashtags popping up. Um, so obviously, I, I don't particularly like Hegel, but... I, I am intrigued by philosophy. It is one of the first things that I I kind of became interested in when I went to the library when my music player broke and I could not afford a replacement. And um, you know, I I suppose I have the the real drawback where. Um, most of what I've learned, I mean, classics, I feel a little bit better on. So, you know, pre-Socratics, I'm, I'm feel like I'm pretty strong with. Um, I never really did a proper, like, formal study of Plato, but I can appreciate him much better now as this great synthesis of the pre-Socratics. Uh, spent a little less time with Aristotle, although actually that's uh, very close to the first one I was in, uh, I got into, uh, Algren's. He's an incredibly good writer, so he's a good one to start with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it can be as it can be as as much of a cliche as it may be. Like, there's worse ways of starting, right? 
Um, mine was actually The Birth of Tragedy, which wound up being an unexpectedly useful um, little bit of reading for me to do. Um, but yeah, he, by the way, Nietzsche would have killed Twitter. Like, he would have been great at it. Um, not that, like, being good at Twitter matters, but he he's definitely somebody who... Uh, would have nailed it. Anyway, sorry. I'm gonna open up the open up the game. I was meaning. I found my copy of um, this book, Zarathustra. Um, again. Oh, neat. So there's a reason why I'm taking a slightly more casual approach, and not just because of the way that I'm feeling. Um, it's interesting that they've added this um, announcements because it it does actually seem like they've made some pretty big changes to um, to the game. So this is where I was feeling okay, sort of shifting around with some of the the details. Um, but yeah, anyways, all that I was going to say is that, like, basically, um, I've noticed that uh, for the last little while, um, Twitter's gotten a little bit better at giving me some hashtags that I'm interested in. That's why I wanted to follow up on the Hegel thing. Um, and again, it's a little hard to disentangle from the, uh, the threat of acquisition, at least, um, because, you know, a sinking share price or or at least a, a stagnant share price is probably going to be one of those things that and a change in management um is probably going to kick some people in the backside to to get some work done um okay so um i was taking a look at some of the community so one of the things i wanted to take a look at was to see whether or not the uh third scenario for heroes of the aegean was reworked I actually saw in some of the comments that apparently the Rome versus Carthage one is very, very difficult. So that's one of the reasons I'm going to be putting it on hold for tonight. Um, but let's read these patch notes. Uh, design free worker bonus card now unlocks with administration instead of polis. Egyptian improvement cost bonus now only tests for finished improvements. Events that reduce discontent have had the discontent reduction value doubled. That's pretty good, actually. Um, blessed and curse now remove the opposing effect. Uh, choose law events now occur less frequently when the player has a higher civics threshold. Added four learn by playing scenarios. So this is one thing I'm very interested in. Um, show resor resources and improvements now. Just shows urban improvements. Programming improved rivers on the lowest detail settings. Uh, minor improvements to the AI. Improvements to uh, disciples. AI is more intelligent about succession and reassigning jobs. UI, all improvements, worker, uh, worker filter now shows improvements in a grid. Bridge model appears when roads cross rivers with the engineering law. When going from simple to advanced settings, a number of AI opponents get set to the default for that map size. More help text has been added to the server screen. Uh, movement pip colors turn orange when force marched is used with force march set to double fatigue. Reminder added for when laws can be adopted. Announcement panel has been added to the main menu. Unavailable scenarios are now grayed out. Uh, added an indicator to the single player setup screen where dynasties are available. Uh, added right click menu to portraits for council slots, religion, family, heads, uh, nation, tribe leaders, and added a slider to adjust the pop up text size and accessibility options. Uh, bug fixes, improvements to localized texts, improvement to camera pan. Game no longer shows orders preview or path for moves outside of force march limits. Uh, fixed issues in the mod browser, various tech... I didn't know there was a mod browser. Oh, right. You probably have to download them still. Uh, various text and event fixes, no longer possible to hire units on city tiles. I never thought it was possible. Um, fixed issues uh, found in no characters mode. Fixed issue with terrain around mountains. Fixed an issue in recapturing a teammate city. Edit hotkeys now working again. Nested tooltips now show when locked with shift. So I think that was something I tried to do and it didn't seem to work out. Uh, Carthage 1, build a market in cart hatch. Goal now completes. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think we had a problem completing it, but Barbarian Horde fixed raiders being able to spawn on inaccessible tiles. Uh, Tribe Peace Alliance ambitions are no longer present in the scenario. Oh, sorry, this is the scenario. Right, right, right. Uh, but Barbarian Horde is a, a specific scenario. Uh, very small UI improvements, Russian adjustments on how turn scale is handled, fixed an issue where C site text was not appearing when revealed but not visible, fixed a sorting issue for choose research pop up, fixed a minor issue with Greece 4 end condition causing errors. 
fixed underwater trees on the Mediterranean. <laughs> okay, I kind of wish I could have seen that. Uh, fixed an issue with the city widget on a high graphic preset. Additional adjustments to events where traits are chosen in the next turn. We no longer show defeated nations from luxury, the luxury management panel. Game no longer shows could change succession warning when there's no air. Uh, improvements to Hero the Aegean's achievement unlock conditions. Fixed player list uh, sorting in front of some menus. Fixes source of power and family quarrel events. Additional event fixes. Fixed potential game hang uh, from family favors event. And new announcement panel. We will use this place to help make game updates and community events more visible from inside the game itself. It will show up automatically when there is a new version unless you check the hide announcements in the options menu. I like this because I am subscribed to the uh, Mohawk emails, but I will confess that they... So they update this game a lot and it's wonderful, but I have started to be numbed a little bit to it. And so... Um, you know, I'm sometimes I'm sometimes out of the loop on important changes, and this is great because instead of me like getting that email while you know maybe I'm it's the morning and you know I want to read my news and stuff like that, um, this is a chance for me to read it at a time when I am invested in uh, in the um, when I'm kind of invested in the changes. Excuse me. So. I want to see Learn to Play. Here we go. Uh, learn by playing Babylonia the Able, Egypt the Just, Persia the Good, Rome the Strong. Okay, so I don't know how I feel about this. Medium Seaside Map, the Able difficulty. Learn Old World by playing with our dynamic tutorial system, which teaches you the game as you play. These scenarios are not scripted and play just like a regular game, but have tutorial pop-ups that explain each game concept. So I suppose one of the questions I would have is... Like what, how is that different from me? One of the things I was thinking of doing was just starting like a brand new game, uh, choosing as a leader. Um, we have been doing um, Rise of Carthage, Rise of Rome. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about is I haven't been playing on the Able, so I might be learning some bad habits. But yeah, actually this sounds like a decent way to go. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that I did get uh, a bit of an indication from someone that Rise of Rome is actually very, very difficult. Uh, so, so much so they suggested that it is actually better to play and get good at military matters um, in the base game rather than play the scenarios. And of course, for me, I was playing the scenarios to learn. So let's, um, let's give this a shot. So medium seaside map, the able difficulty, learn old world by playing with our dynamic tutorial system, which teaches you the game as you play. These scenarios are not scripted and play just like the regular game, but have tutorial pop-ups that explain each game concept. One other thing I wanted to do, um, <clears throat> it's always nice to double check if there's a patch just in case something comes up. So yeah, my apologies if you were coming here to see the next bit of the, uh, the Carthage scenario. I'm just really not I'm not 100% today, so um, one of the things I was thinking of doing was starting a new scenario, and when I run into trouble, to actually go to the go to the guide um, that has been published with it. Because the thing is, is that it's so useful that they that they put that out, but it's quite long, and I I do kind of like learning stuff for myself. So I've I really have under like undervalued the. You know this this thing that they put a lot of effort into making so um but we'll i don't know we'll figure it out um i'll also confess i've been playing a bit more civilization so i've been playing beyond earth and um civilization six lately and i i really feel like that like i should have enough knowledge to handle both but i think particularly with military units I'm really bad at building a decent military in, uh, well, in both games, really. But, like, Civilization, I, I definitely, like, underinvest in the military, and I can usually get by um, through it. And that just feels like a recipe for disaster in this game. <laughs> no, Garth, it might as well siege us with random gameplay. Yeah, siege, you say, huh? Time for some Rainbow Six. Anyways, <clears throat> let's give this a shot. 
You are Nebuchadnezzar, wisest king of Babylonia. The myths of your people claim that you descend from a distant line of kings, but your people are broken and battered from disasters. Finally taking your birthright, it falls on you to lead the people of Babylonia into the old world to forge a nation of knowledge and glory, one that will be remembered through the ages. The existing excuse me, civilizations of this old world do not yet know the splendor and wisdom of Babylonia, but they will learn. Select your settler and found your capital city. You'll also decide which family members, uh, sorry, family manages your first city, gaining their advantages immediately. So I have a few options. One thing I love about, and I honestly, I feel like this should be something that Civ does, and I don't know why they don't do this. Um, <clears throat> but notice, right, as you as you move the settler. Well, actually, okay, so uh, Civ, Civ actually handles this in a slightly different way, too. So um, I can now I, <laughs> I I should maybe think before I speak. Um, there are reasons why uh, Civ doesn't do it this way, because it's, it's not as useful. Um, but I really like this kind of preview of what you get, like what you have access to um, before you move your unit. <clears throat> the reason why I find this really helpful is... It like I do sometimes struggle when it comes to um, planning out where to put settlers. So like overall, uh, Old World manages this problem beautifully. Uh, it has the city sites first of all, <clears throat> but on top of that, so number one, you can't just settle anywhere. But number two, it gives you a very clear idea of what your borders are going to be if you don't do any other interventions. So for instance, if I settle here, uh, I'll have access to the game, I'll have access to the marble, but I won't have access to the elephants. Um, and you know, there's some of these other, like there's um, plate or is it planes flat? Anyways, temperate flat territory here. Um, you can sort of see if I move one down, well, that'll get me the elephants, um, but I'll lose the marble for that. And the one thing you can see here is if I move right to the edge, uh, you know, further up the Araxes River, I have control of both game, the elephants, and the marble. And so in that case, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, for me, I think, a pretty considerable advantage to, um, you know, to build here. One small wor uh, worry I might have would be the access to lumber. Um, we can maybe make a little triangle here, but that's about it. But I don't know, like early access to four, you know, four resources. It's kind of hard to complain about that. So, so like the next question is, what do we want to, um, you know, what do we want to found? Well, in this case, the Cassites definitely seem like, a, well, it does show you what you get, but like, in so what I'm specifically thinking of is that if you, so Civ doesn't have an undo button. And it like if you move your settler and then you find out, oh, okay, actually I changed my mind or, oh, that didn't actually turn out the way that I wanted. Like you've, you've given up your turn with that settler. Um, and in my view that, you know, like, you know, again, the, the distance for the settler, like the, the little area that you get around it is like, it's a bit more standard, so it's not as big of a problem, but just being able to get this nice little preview of saying is like, okay, so these are going to be what your borders are like. This is what you're going to have access to. Um, you know, you, this is like, I have a pretty good idea from the start where my like not just where my borders are but i also can make some inferences in terms of how it's going to expand over time uh and that's not always as clear in civ in my opinion um for instance i'm not 100 percent sure how the uh the tile expansion works in civ it i don't know if it's randomly assigned or not whereas here i know i'm probably going to have a worker on the marble and i'm probably going to have a worker on the elephants so these areas are going to be taken and then you know the game as well but Yeah, welcome, Vanguard Master. And Tikree. So, guys, a special mention to Tikree, who, in addition to being a, an emote artist, and I really need to start getting uh, better at, at shouting that out. Um, Tikree very thoughtfully recommended a film. I'm hoping I get this right. Glorious, right? 
Um, now, it's kind of funny, too, because it didn't like this is absolutely something I would not have looked twice at. But she really, um, really did a a good job of sort of figuring out something that I would I would like. Now, I'm, you know, also in fairness, like there was a there's a tip off in terms of stuff that I was interested in. Um, but I was I, I had a very I had a good time with it. I noticed the IMDb ratings are actually quite low. And it's funny because it's one of the few times I've watched something which has not been. Um, like I was talking about this with her afterwards, like it's hard for me to necessarily say that it's a good movie. Like I think that it's a really good premise, which and it, there's a lot of really good ideas in the movie and it doesn't always successfully execute on them. But that doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable to watch. Um, and again, like I've got the two tracks going, right? My analytical side and my my viewer side. J.K. Simmons uh, is in it. It's sort of Lovecraftian. Well, not sort of. It is Lovecraftian. Um, but it's got a wonderful sense of humor uh, for what is essentially a horror film. And um, I don't know. I really felt that the I really felt that the um, the IMDb reviews were really harsh for it. But it was actually a ton of fun. I'm actually probably going to wind up watching it again because I was talking about it with someone, and they're like, "Oh, I have no idea." Yeah, yeah. Uh, to create, it's not. So here's the thing. I don't feel. I don't feel like they pulled the rug out from under you in the sense like there's absolutely nothing that you could could see in the film to to identify that twist. Um, but it's just one of these things where that is such a big reveal and there's just so little time spent like processing that. Like that's something that really could have been... Um, either built up to or sort of resolved in the story. Um, and I, I I've just, it's one of those examples where I think that's actually a really interesting idea, particularly because of what the, the God says to him at the end. Um, and I, I just really feel like they didn't like they, they had, they had the twist. Um, but there wasn't that much done with it other than the 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 surprise um so that's that's kind of where i was was going with it but yeah like as 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 soon as we were talking about it like i, I immediately thought back to probably about three or four different uh like three or four different um scenes or or uh details that would would be sort of a a leading indicator um but yeah it was it was just more um it was more. I, I just felt that they could have done, uh, they could have done more with it. That's true for a couple of other things too. But yeah, like this is the thing. Like I don't want, I don't want to take a really lovely recommendation from someone and like just kind of crap all over it. Like I, I had a, I had a really jolly good time with it. And if you, if you don't mind, you know, something that's not necessarily going to be a film school, <laughs> you know, pick. Um, I, I had a lot of fun watching Glorious and I'm I'm very grateful to to Cree for for recommending it. That's actually really funny cuz I'm I'm totally forcing someone to watch it with me now. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh we we were doing um Old World. So, um so um Cassites are a little more time. It's actually kind of funny too because I was I I think I was said I was going to do a little bit more of a military focus anyway. But the camps make a lot of sense with the game. Um, there is the small argument for the Chaldeans because of the marble, but it's hard to see. Oh, wait, no, that's a quarry anyway, so that's not going to be a, a mine, and we don't have much, that much for lumber mills. Um, the Isen or Isen um, traders, it's kind of hard to see this as being a... Kind of hard to see this as being a really good starting option. And then there's there are the Amorites, which are tempting. Um you know, as far as the extra civics are concerned, that will mean that I can build up, um, I can build up my infrastructure faster. Um, 
Also, the additional science is really nice doubling down on some advantages that uh, Babylonia has on, on its own. But this really feels like a Cassite start. Now, I'm almost wondering if the game is actually quietly trying to push you towards the Cassites with this, um, this start. Yeah, so so far as these dynamic tutorials seem to be the same ones that you get in the base new game. So I might just be playing on a considerably easier difficulty, but hey, that's fine. Uh, orders are an important feature of Old World. Units can move multiple times each turn, but each move consumes one order. Other actions, such as attacking or building, also consume orders. Uh, your remaining orders can be seen in the lower left corner of your screen. We recommend that you first select your worker so that you may begin to improve your land before you spend all of your orders for the turn. I'll have to consider how to use my orders carefully each turn. So we get to choose research. Uh, game is recommending stone cutting for me. Now that's definitely not uh, not a bad one to consider uh, because it does give me quarry, which is a fairly important development. Um, ironworking is also very tempting because of the warrior. So I suppose the question is, you know, do I feel like I I can go this long without building a quarry research, uh, resource? Alternatively, we could try a redraw. Uh, we know that we would get a free worker in the draw pile, so I'd actually prefer to. I'd actually prefer to delay that. So yeah, we could do the shrine, we could do uh, stone cutting, or we could do the quarry. What does the game have to say about it? Stone cutting allows you to build quarries in your cities, an essential improvement that provides a steady income of stone. It also allows for the construction of forts to provide an early line of protection. Increasing the defense, line of sight, and healing of a unit in the same tile. I still feel like I should be doing doing something with the warrior. Now we'll go for the recommendation for now. Workers build improvements for your city. Rural improvements, such as farms and mines, gather raw materials. Urban improvements, such as barracks and shrines, uh, provide training or culture. With some exceptions, urban improvements must be built on or adjacent to other urban tiles. A lack of urban improvements will lead to discontent, so plan carefully and leave some room for them near your cities. Improvement output can be augmented with specialists from the city screen. Let's get to work. Okay, so uh, they want me to start with the Oracle and the Hanging Gardens for a start. Um, I think I'll start with farms and camps. So 2 growth, 12 food, or 4 growth, 20 food. Okay, so it's... Even though it's going to cost me more orders, I think the uh, camp makes more sense. I have two explorers. Scouts are fantastic explorers that can see further into the unknown than other units. They can also hide in trees, making them invaluable as an early warning against invading enemies. Send your scout into the wilderness and look for new city sites and mysterious ancient ruins. Scouts, as well as settlers and workers, can also harvest resources. Uh, I was actually want to handle... So we will put ourselves on the throne. And then not enough orders for the All right, well, that's life. A city governor can be recruited from your court by clicking the wreath icon button below the city banner or within the city screen. A governor can boost the yields of a city based on their unique traits. A governor, with the exception of the leader, cannot be from a different family uh, from that city. I will sign some governors to help my cities and we'll end the year. Princess uh, Kashaya is old enough to be tutored by courtiers. Time passes. Princess Kashaya is uh, growing up fast and eager to learn. How would you like to educate her? Uh, let's go for philosophy, again, doubling down on our advantages. And apparently I neglected the fact that we have more than one free worker. So, uh, no, hang on. I don't have the quarry yet. Why am I being so dumb? Ah, uh, this is probably more efficient. Uh. Oh, I didn't even change the um, production. Okay, well, we've got a city site down here, so that's not a complete waste. 
Carved wall. Our troops discover a towering wall depicting images and carvings belonging to an ancient civilization with an impeccable record of their laws. Our generals want to preserve such findings. What do you advise? Advise? I command! Bring the wall to Babylon. Uh, so it becomes steadfast, bonus against tribes. Um, or I'm glad I have such wise generals. I highly value their service. So the question is, do I want the, um, do I want an early tech or do I want the big culture bonus in, um, in Babylon? Let's get an early tech. Babylonia discovers a new technology, aristocracy. Uh, also, we're already using up our turn. Okay, well, we'll harvest. Your scout can be has moved on to some gems, a harvestable resource. Scouts, settlers, and workers can spend an order to harvest yields from harvestable resources. To do so, click the basket icon in the action panel on the left while your scout is selected and standing on the harvestable resource. A harvestable resource takes a number of turns to renew before it can be harvested again. Resources that were within a city's limits or that are too far from your cities cannot be harvested. Harvesting is a great way to boost my early economy. So there's a couple reasons why I'm doing this. One, uh, I already know that I'm going to be checking out this city site. Uh, this is probably going to be the one where I get the uh, lumber bonuses. Uh, and then it's just a, there was a chance for me to pick up some goodies. Actually, there's more than one place I can go. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to do with this city site. So the question is, do I move this scout up here to look at the other one? Or do I move my scout to the right to see what's going on? That's okay. Tooltips. The nested tooltip system in Old World allows windows to persist as you link from one to the other. Simply hold shift while clicking a link or click it with the middle mouse button to lock the new window in place. This lets you continue uh, to view a window while opening more links, even if you move the cursor off the window altogether. Try that out on this unit link, Spearman. Uh, press the escape key or click away from the tooltip windows to make them disappear uh, after they are locked. I will lock tooltips in place with shift click to discover more information. The slinger is a ranged unit with a default maximum range of two tiles. Ranged units can shoot further from the top of a hill, but suffer a minus 20% damage reduction for every tile between them and their target. Firing into trees or scrub also reduces their damage. It is not time to sling some rocks. I need to get my people doing stuff. So I had a harvesting opportunity there. Let's keep looking in the... We already know that we're gonna, um, we're gonna take this city site for sure, and then I can probably put my scientists over here. Inspired by a divine hand, Princess Kashaya, uh, sorry, uh, Kashaya embarks on an ambitious piece of public art, a wall painting to line the entrance of Babylon's central promenade. Kashaya will continue her training as she works, but the effort may take an exhausting toll. As Kashaya's patron, do you endorse this undertaking? We can say she must be focused on the formal education and becomes estranged from me, or a piece of public art will prove a worthy lesson. So the drawback is that I will have this. Remember, this is the first in line. So the drawback is, is that uh, there will be a reduction in discipline, which is going to cost me uh, in terms of income. And if that if I, that were to happen to Nebuchadnezzar, I would be at um, 10 well or 10 money, 10 wealth, 10 gold uh, rather than 30. So two thirds of my income goes away uh, as a result of that. But um I'd rather not be estranged, and we might be able to to deal with that through other means. So uh, let's keep 
going. I definitely want to check out these city sites to just see if there's anything cool that I can get in the immediate area. Yeah, so I think we've pretty much got our expansion plans for the next few turns. One curiosity is going to be whether or not it's worth it for me to just keep spamming settlers. Because we do have a bunch of growth that we're getting from all of these improvements. Nation contact. You've encountered a rival nation. Rival nations are your primary opponents in Old World. You may engage them diplomatically, which could lead to gaining a powerful trade partner and ally, or declare war on them to conquer their territory. You decide which nations are worthy of, de uh, of being your allies and which should simply be conquered. At some difficulty levels, other nations begin the game already established as a number of s with a number of cities, units, and improvements. If you hover the mouse over a series name in the leaderboard in the top left of the screen, you can find out important information about them, such as the number of cities they have, how strong their military is, how developed they are technologically, and also with whom they are currently at war or peace. To conduct diplomacy, you must appoint an ambassador, and it requires uh, aristocracy. I will do my best to make some friends. King Nebuchadnezzar the Founder has tutored Princess Kashaya, improving her wisdom. And unwilling to put effort into anything, uh, Queen Consort Amis, your wife, is slothful. Okay, so it's always tempting to go for drama because of the music. Uh, I'm going to take the free worker. That is going to take up a bunch of my... Uh, it's not clear where the Assyrians are. Okay. We will tutor the young one again. Um, ah. A burly smith maintains an ancient forge in the ruins. She explains that she trades iron weapons to nomads in exchange for food. As long as you don't touch her stockpile of ore, she is willing to share her expertise with you. What do you say? We can learn her trade and gain ironworking. This will be particularly helpful given the fact that we have a potentially hostile neighbor next to us. Or loot her metal stores and we become cruel. No, we will learn her trade. Babylonia discovers a new technology, ironworking. Okay. Um, now, I haven't used my time particularly well because I have a worker which has been sitting idle, and I should have been paying attention to that. So we will move up to work the marble, but we're going to have to do that, uh, finish that later. Uh, we've got Babylon. So <clears throat> Settler's going to cost, uh, going to take four years. Now, again, it would be wonderful for me to do things like, um, gain the farmer, the trapper, but these all cost civics and they take longer than the settler. So in this case here, I actually don't think it's a bad idea for me to sort of expand um, a bit more rapidly than I, I originally had in mind. So your second city, your capital has finished training a new settler. Settlers are key to expanding your nation because only they can found new cities. Take the settler to a nearby site to establish a new city. City sites can be claimed prior to sending a settler to colonize them. Place a unit of any type on the city site tile to claim it as your own, thereby preventing foreign settlers from founding a city there. When you found a city, you will have to choose which family to grant it to. This family will provide bonuses to the city after granting a city to a third district, a distinct family, you will lose access to your nation's fourth family. So carefully consider what bonuses you want and which family you can go without. I'll choose the next family carefully. The tech deck. Upon completing the research for a new technology, you will unlock the ne next technology on the tree, entering it in the discard pile, and four new cards will be drawn from the draw pile of available technologies for you to sele select from. After making your new selection from the four drawn cards, the remaining three cards will be sent to the discard pile and ultimately recycled back into the draw pile when it is empty. Free unit and bonus cards are never recycled and are instead permanently discarded if not chosen. 
Rural yields. Uh, rural yields are food, iron, stone, and wood. They are primarily drawn from rural improvements and collect uh, in the global stockpile. You can spend money to purchase rural yields directly from the top bar where it shows your current stockpile. The primary source of food is farms, which are the most fruitful, uh, which are most fruitful next to fresh water and on lush terrain. Food is needed to feed your population and to produce new settlers. The primary source of iron is mines, which are most productive on ore and hills. Iron is needed to produce many types of military units, including warriors and axemen. The primary source of stone is your quarries, uh, which are most productive on marble and arid terrain and when adjacent to mountains. Uh, stone is needed primarily to build improvements like shrines and city projects such as walls. The forestry tech enables the construction of lumber mills on trees to produce wood. Uh, workers also cut can also cut down trees with the uh, axe button in the actions panel. Wood is needed to uh, build city improvements like barracks, military units like archers, and ship units like biremes. I'll build more farms and mines. All right, so again, I didn't manage my orders well. That's something I'm going to have to remember, but we'll, uh, we'll handle, handle it. You can use your ambassador to conduct diplomatic missions. Just select the portrait of your ambassador in the top right, and you will see their available actions in the panel on the left-hand side of the screen. The ambassador can make peace with nations and tribes, form a trade mission, uh, offer uh, and demand tribute, and more. I'll use my ambassador for diplomatic missions. Uh, or maybe I won't, but... So similar power, primitive knowledge. Interesting. Change my mind, I'm gonna go for this middle one. Okay, so this is one that I think the um, Chaldeans make the most sense for because of the lumber potential here. Uh, in fact, if I build here, not only do I get the lumber, but I can also build some iron mines here. Now known as Nebuchadnezzar the Settler. You were the first to discover this landmark. What will you name it? Um, should maybe leave this for chat. Should we Should we keep it as the... Uh, uh, Pesit, uh, I guess it's Pasatigris River? I'm going to keep this one as it is, but if anybody has any recommendations for landmarks, I will, I will open... Uh, I will open chat up for the uh, the possibilities. Uh, cities produce the following yields. Growth, training, civics, money, science, culture, and discontent. Growth, training, and civics are all used for city production. Growth for civilian units, training for military units, and civics for projects and specialists. Uh, when not being used for city production, training and civics go to the global stockpile, and growth goes into the production of new citizens. Culture and discontent both go into their respective progress bars. When the culture bar fills, a positive event occurs and new improvements and wonders are unlocked. When the discontent, discontent bar fills, maintenance goes up and growth and science go down. Money and science both go directly into the global stockpile. Okay, um, let's get that quarry built. <clears throat> This is quite a bit further away than where I wanted my uh, my explorer to be, but... Oh, political prisoner. Our scouts encounter a party of Persian soldiers whipping a man bound by his wrists and ankles. The warriors accuse the man of inciting rebellion, of stalking members of the royal family and attempting to infiltrate the treasury. However, the victim insists that he is innocent of the crimes. Uh, the Persians urge our men to move along and mind their business. So we can follow their... Uh, Follow the advice. Uh, we gain 40 opinion, but we become cruel. Or fight them for possession of the prisoner. 
A new court minister, uh, Cambyses, uh, has joined our court. His aptitude in matters of state will keep Babylonia moving forward. We're really good at making friends. Um... So yeah, the, the more settlers I can keep cranking out, the better it feels like. I kind of wasted my worker here, but... So nine years for a settler, it's hard to justify this particular one. I think in this case, I'm just going to go for whatever, whatever I can produce most quickly. Uh, in this case, we'll go for the treasury. Okay, so... Game's recommending Polis, uh, and it's hard to argue with it, but again, we have another boost, and I feel like, given that we've been running a deficit of stone, an extra 200's not the sort of thing I want to turn down. So. I've already got a free worker here. Um... Well, so much for... <laughs> I was thinking whether I could try and ninja that away from the Assyrians, but no. Uh, I was originally going to put another... Uh, this is going to be a hard one. So this is not a bad choice for the... Well, actually, honestly, there's a few things that work for it. So there is game here, so this could be one for the Kassites. Um, the Chaldeans can definitely make something of the trees... There's a few hills for um, mines. Well, this is kind of miney too, I guess. Oh yeah, no, this is totally a Chaldean area. Um, okay, well in that case, uh, I still need my third family, so I guess this will be the one for the third family. Not exactly what I was planning, but... Always tutor where we can. Um, now, this isn't the most exciting choice, but at least I can... Oh, hang on. Idle worker. Shameful. Um... Let's chop down some trees. The Eduba. Hey, Noxcam, how you doing? Um, how was work then? And uh, what was work, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, Eduba. Or... I have no idea what E2 stands for. Edababa? Edaba? Edaba? Hmm. Uh, Sumerian for scribal school. The Edaba was an institution that trained the educated young scribes in ancient Mesopotamia during the late or early uh, second millennium BCE. Most of the information about Edibas come from cuneiform texts dating to the old Babylonian period uh, around 2000 to 1600 BCE. Um... That's a totally different spelling from above. Edaba. Edaba is written Edaba in Sumerian. The literal meaning is House of Tablets. Retail at a theme park. The shop I had today was really slow. Also boring because you're the only one working there. Did you like, did they give you any training or, or was this like trial by fire first day? Uh, archaeological evidence. Archaeological evidence for the old Babylonian school system suggests that scribal education was small-scale and usually took place in private homes. School tablets have been found in private residences in many sites excuse me, across Mesopotamia. 
Some houses, uh, where particularly large numbers of school tablets were unearthed, have been interpreted by archaeologists as schoolhouses or homes in which scribal education almost certainly took place. The best example is the House F in the city of Nipper. Nearly one and a half thousand fragments of tablets were found at this house. They date to the 17th century BCE, short chronology, uh, the early part of Samu Iluna's reign, and the majority of them were student school exercises. Two other possible school houses are located on the site of Ur. The first uh, is the house called Number 7 Quiet Street, where a smaller number of school texts were found in situ and date to the late 18th or early 17th century BCE, short chronology, reigns of Rimsin II or as late as Samsu Aluna, year 11. The second is uh, a house called Number 1 Broad Street, where a large number of school tablets were discovered. Some texts from Number 1 Broad Street may date as late as Samsu Iluna, year 11, 1674 BCE, short chronology, 1738 middle chronology. Unfortunately, it's unclear whether this house is the school text's original place of use. Another old Babylonian home in which scribal training took place is the house of a man uh, named Ur uh, Utu, located in the ancient city of Sippar uh, Am Aman, sorry, Amanum. Uh, I just want to see if we can get anything. Oh my god, there's so much. Um, oh, we'll, okay, we'll read. Uh, we'll read through it. Um, the modern idea of, uh, of how the Eduba functioned is based primarily on descriptions from Sumerian literature. This is especially true of earlier scholarship, e.g. Soberg, 1975, Kramer, 1949. A number of stories set in scribal school or attest to what life was like as a scribal student. These are sometimes referred to by modern scholars as the Edibah literature, not to be confused with the second meaning of the term, any composition learned and copied by scribal students or school stories. They include the composition School Days, Edibah A, a scribe and his perverse son, Edibah B, uh, the advice of a supervisor to a younger scribe, uh, Edibah C, scribal activities, Edibah D, Instruction, instructions of the Yumia, Ediba E, and regulations of the E <laughs> Diva, Ediba R. A few Sumerian dialogues also touch on elements of student life, including a dialogue between two scribes, Dialogue 1, a dialogue between Enki Hangal and Enkita Lu, Dialogue 2, the Enki, uh, Enki Mansion and Grini Itsang, Dialogue 3, Several royal hymns recounting the exploit, exploits of Mesopotamian kings uh, also make reference to the institution of the Ediba. These include the compositions of Sulgi B, Lipit Esther B, Ismay Dagon V, and Benel Bani uh, A. Or maybe it's not A, maybe it's just B. <clears throat> uh, several old Babylonian letters and proverbs also allude to scribal education or the Ediba. The historical accuracy of Edibah literature and other texts referring to the Edibah, the extent to which they describe the reality of old Babylonian scribal education, has been called into question in more recent scholarship. Archaeological evidence suggests that scribal training during the old, Babyl uh, during the old Babylonian took place in private houses rather than in large public uh, institutions. This led some scholars to suggest that the content of the Edibah literature actually refers to an earlier institution dating back to the Ur III period. Others maintain simply that the literary accounts are exaggerated or anachronistic, or that they reflect an idealized image of the school system. Tablets bearing student exercises. A lot of student learning was done by writing out cuneiform compositions, school texts, on clay tablets. A large number of tablets preserving scribal students' exercises, called exercise tablets, have been found at sites throughout the Near East. These come in different shapes and sizes, depending on the level of the student and how advanced the assignment was. The following is a typology of tablet shapes discovered, sorry, developed by modern scholars based primarily on tablets from the old Babylonian city of Nippur. The extent to which the same typology applies to exercise tablets from other cities uh, in which scribes were being trained uh, is not yet clear. Type 1. Type 1 tablets are multi-column tablets, usually containing several hundred lines of a composition written out by a student in two or more columns. These tablets are often large enough to accommodate an entire composition, and sometimes even contain parts of multiple compositions. In cases where a whole composition does not fit on a single tablet, it may be spread out across multiple tablets. Because Type 1 tablets tend to be very carefully written and contain long text, it is assumed that they represent the work of relatively advanced students. Type 2. Type 2 tablets are formatted with two or more columns on the obverse, the front of the tablet, and multiple columns of a usually different text on the reverse, the back side of the tablet. 
The left-hand column of the obverse contains a passage or extract from a school text, usually about 8 to 15 lines, but sometimes as long as 30, written in a neat hand, presumably by the teacher. The right-hand columns contain a copy of the passage, usually more sloppily written, and presumably written by the student. The student's copy would have been erased and rewritten multiple times, and many of the extant Type 2 tablets are blank on the right-hand side, or, as is most common, the right-hand side is broken off completely. Now, the reverse of a Type 2 tablet usually contains an excerpt of a different school text, uh, one the student would have learned earlier in his education. Type 2 tablets are by far the most common type of exercise tablet discovered at Nipper. Proportionately fewer Type 2 tablets are known from other sites, but it is possible that uh, more were found but never published. Type 2 tablets are usually somewhat distorted looking, often broken or erased, meaning that looters are less likely to have kept and sold them, and early excavators are perhaps less likely to have published them. Type 3 tablets are uh, also known as ec uh, extract tablets or im imgitis? imgitis? Sumerian for the long tablet are single column tablets containing extracts, usually around 40 to 60 lines from longer compositions often belonging to the advanced stages of scribal education. <clears throat> type 4, lentils. Type 4 tablets, also known as lentils, are circular tablets containing one or, of a f one or a few lines of composition written out once by the teacher and then a second time by the student. The student's copy appears underneath the teacher's inscription, typical of the Nipper tablets, or the on the reverse, uh, more typical of other sites. Prisms. Prisms are large clay objects with multiple faces, usually four or nine, pierced through the center from the top to the bottom with a hole. A prism usually bears a complete cuneiform text written in sections across all of the faces. Prisms were sim seemingly inscribed by advanced scribal students in very careful writing, and they are relatively rare. A possible explanation for this is that they served as exams. Another theory is that these texts were created as votive offerings to be dedicated in temples to the Mesopotamian deities. Um, all right, I, I am actually kind of interested in this, so I'm going to keep reading, but I'm really feeling it in my throat. Um, so if you can just give me a second, I'm going to put the kettle on to replenish my tea. Um, I'll be back to read the rest of it and I'll make the tea later. Sorry, I'll be, I'll try and be quick. Sorry about that. I'm really trying to keep it together tonight, but it's a struggle. Scribal curriculum at Nipper. The curriculum for young students learning to write in Edubaz in this, of the city of Nipper has been reconstructed from texts found at the, uh, sorry, the site uh, that date to the old Babylonian period. It is unclear to what extent the same curriculum was followed in other cities. Elementary education. At the first level of Sumer of Sumerian scribal education, students learn the basics of cuneiform writing and Sumerian by writing out long lists of signs and words and by copying simple texts. This level of education was broken down into four stages. Uh, early stage, writing techniques. In the earliest stage of education, students learn the fundamentals of cuneiform writing, how to work with clay and form tablets, how to handle a stylus, how to make basic signs, how to write simple things like personal names. In the earliest exercises of stage one, students repeatedly copied out the three elements of a cuneiform sign, the vertical wedge, the horizontal wedge, and the oblique wedge. Once the wedge shapes had been mastered, the student could start combing them to make simple signs. Some exercise tablets show a student practicing simple sign, uh, sorry, a simple sign or signs over and over again. Next, the student learned to write out a list of signs known as uh, Sibylline Alphabet B, also sometimes referred to as the Sumerian Primer. Each entry in this list composed of, uh, sorry, comprised a few signs or syllables, which sometimes resembled Sumerian words or personal names, but actually contained little meaning. 
They were designed to teach the student the correct sign forms. Outside of Nipper, a similar list, known as the Sybil Alphabet A, was taught in place of Sybil Alphabet B. In some cases, the student also had to write out columns of Akkadian words, forming a list uh, known as Sybil Vocabulary A. Another list designed to teach students the basics of cuneiform writing was known as Tutati. In this list, which students wrote out sets of signs grouped according to their initial sounds. Each cuneiform sign represents a syllable, unlike the English alphabet, where each letter represents a sound. Thus, for example, the sequence Tutati consists of three signs. The signs uh, within each set of the list were ordered by their vowel sounds, U followed by A followed by I. Each sign in the set was first written on its own, uh, own line, and then all three signs were written together on a fourth line. Thus, the first eight lines of Tutati are Tutati, Tutati, Nunani, Nunani. Students in stage one of their education also learn to write lists of personal names, comprising Sumerian uh, or Akkadian names. Second stage, thematic noun lists. In the second stage of elementary scribal education, students started learning words and logograms. They memorized and wrote out thematically organized lists of nouns, which later developed in, uh, into the first millennium lexical list, uh, Ura uh, Hubulu. Uh, by memorizing this list, students learned Sumerian words for objects in different categories, including trees and wooden objects, reeds and reed objects, vessels and clay, hides and leather objects, metal and metal objects, types of animals and meat, stones and plants, etc. Third stage, advanced lists. In the third stage of elementary education, students learn numbers, measurements, and common formulas used in economic contracts. They also um, learn more complex lists than those memorized in earlier stages. The sign list Proto-Ea, the thematic list of Proto-Lu, and a set of uh, acrographic lists, uh, lists with entries organized by the first or main sign, including uh, proto itsi proto Kagal, and I have no idea the pronu correct pronunciation, so I'm going to try Naga. <laughs> um, the first, uh, the sign list, uh, proto Diri, was also learned during uh, the third stage of elementary education. A number of other less frequently attested lists could be learned at this point. The body part list, uh, Ugmu, a list of legal phrases, an early version of the list known as Ana Itsu, a list of deities called the Nipper God List, uh, the old Babylonian version of a list of professions called Lu Aslag Aslaku, and a list of diseases. Fourth stage, simple Sumerian test, texts. The fourth stage of elementary education, students began working with full sentences in Sumerian. They copied out model contracts and legal texts, e.g. contracts documenting the sale of houses, and finally Sumerian proverbs. With the study of proverbs, students transitioned into the second level of education, namely Sumerian literature. Advanced education. Advanced uh, edu uh, eduba students, eduba students um, memorized and wrote out Sumerian literary texts beginning with simple proverbs and progressing to much longer works. The Tetrad, the transitional stage from elementary to advanced scribal training, students memorized and wrote out four literary compositions known as the Tetrad. The Tetrad comprises of the following compositions. Lipit Eshtar B, Idin Dagan B, and Lil Bani A and Nisaba A. The Decad, the second stage of an advanced scribal education at Nippur, involved memorization and writing out of a group of 10 compositions designated by modern scholars as the Decad. The Decad includes the following compositions Solgi A, Lipit Estar A. Wait a minute, was that also in. No. Um, Song of the Ho, Inanna B, and Lil A, Kesh Temple Him. Enki's Journey to Nippur, Anana and uh, Ebi, Nungal A, Gilgamesh, and Huawa version A. Other curricular groups of texts. Other groups of Sumerian literary compositions have been posited as collections of texts to be learned as part of the school curriculum. One such group referred to, uh, to as the House F14, named for the old Babylonian house at Nippur, where many copies of the text were found, together with over a thousand other school tablets. House F14 comprised of the following. Eduba B, Eduba uh, C, Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Netherworld, Deeds and Exploits of Ninurta, Cursing of Agade, Silgihem B, Ur Lament, Instructions of the uh, Surupag, School uh, school Days, the, A Debate Between Sheep and Grain, uh, Dumazid's Dream, Farmer's Instructions, Ejiba Dialogue 1, Debate Between the Ho and Plow, 
Another group of texts could be, uh, that could be learned around the same stage of education as the Decad was a selection of letters from the correspondence of the kings of Ur. This corpus did not form a cohesive curricular group, however. Evidently, it was up to the individual school teachers to decide which letters to teach. At least two other sets of literary letters were sometimes learned by scribal students in Old Babylonian Nipper, the Sumerian Epist Epistoli Miscellany, a fairly standardized group composing of, uh, comprising of 18 letters and four other compositions, and the correspondence of the kings of Larsa, a group of four letters uh, for, from or to rulers of Larsa. Other letters not belonging to a definable set were also sometimes studied. These are grouped together by modern scholars under the term additional nipper letters ancillary or ancillary nipper letters. My kettle's been boiling for a while, so sorry. One more, one more break. I am interested in early education, particularly with regards to writing, because, you know, some of this does, so like, some of this we can sort of see, okay, yeah, it seems that some of this is passed down, like, this is apparently a good way to teach people um, uh, you know, writing. There's some which have sort of fallen out of, uh, out of habit. But again, just some of this stuff, particularly because if you think about I guess it depends on on the t uh, the period of history, but you know the idea of being someone who can read or write is a bit of a rarity. So it's it's just interesting to to read a little bit about the uh, the education. Plus, it in my opinion, it makes the events a little more meaningful. So students of the Ejiba probably began their education as young children. They were primarily boys, although female scribes uh, all are also attested uh, in ancient Mesopotamian society. The Ediba literature paints a vivid, if highly embellished, picture of daily life for young scribal students. According to these compositions, a boy would leave his parents' home in the morning, go to the Ediba, and begin his lessons for the day. These included things like reciting texts learned previously and forming new tablets to inscribe. Punishments for misbehavior, talking out of turn, going out at the wrong time, writing poorly, etc. could be harsh. In one exaggerated account, a student, a student describes being beaten no less than seven times in a single day. After a day at school, a student would go home again to his parents, where he might tell them about the events of the day or recite homework assignments to them. These reports in the Edaba literature provide entertaining, often sympathetic stories about what life was like for an old Babylonian scribal student. However, they are idealized to a great extent, and their historical accuracy should not be assumed. So I hope that wasn't too much of a digression, but I'm I'm happy I read that. The aristocratic Babylonian children spend some time learning at the Ediba, a scribal academy. The center of learning ensures that the children are well-versed in the basics of writing and numeracy and are prepared for the scribal profession that many will pass into. Keshaya has been attending the Ediba under the supervision of Cambyses, who says that the girl is skilled but quickly bored by the copying of texts. So it's good practice for her. She can become more disciplined or then she should not have to do it. Now, we're going to become estranged. You unlock the ability to choose an ambition. Ambitions are goals that your families would like you to pursue. Uh, after completing them, uh, and completing them will grant you and all of your descendants a permanent boost to legitimacy. Completing an ambition unlocks a new one, and completing 10 is one way to win via an ambition victory. So always do your best to fulfill your current ambitions. There are a couple of simple ambitions to get you started. So kill five enemy units. I'm not, I haven't really been going down the path of, of uh, the military. I will try to at some point, but we're not really in a position to take advantage of that. We are in a position, though, where we're very likely going to be able to have four cities. So... Let's go for control for cities. King Nebuchadnezzar the Settler has tutored Princess Kashaya, improving her wisdom. The 
court has opened a debate on the topic of cultural enrichment. We can, uh, or of two minds of the matter. We can invest in national epics or we can rely on exploration to bring us new experiences. So epics will get us 10 culture per military unit killed. Uh, heroes will like me more. Or exploration bonuses uh, moving along rivers. Uh, scouts can move on water and hunters will like us for it. So um, this will be very good with one of my city, one of my um, families. But I think I'm going to be a little more bloodthirsty, so let us share our own stories. Okay, more work for us to do. I guess the first question is, can I do a barracks? No. No, I cannot. Your worker has moved into a trees tile. Workers can spend uh, one order to cut down trees with the axe button in the actions panel on the left and two more orders to further clear the land. These actions uh, both harvest wood and add it to your stockpile. The tile in question does not have to be in your territory to cut down the trees. Once cut down, trees take some time to regrow. If you build an improvement on a trees tile, the wood is automatically harvested as the land is cleared at the cost of three orders. Eventually, you can research the forestry tech to enable the construction of lumber mills, which are a more regular and sustainable source of wood. However, they must be built on a trees tile, so don't cut down all of your forests. You can also spend money to purchase wood directly from the top bar where it shows your current stockpile totals. I will cut down forests for wood until I can build lumber mills. Okay, so I do want to cut trees. There's actually not a huge argument for me to keep these forests here, but... I'm actually trying to remember if I've ever had... I'm sure I've had lentils at some point, but I have no memory of them whatsoever. Um, okay, so obviously I still want to like, be able to see what's going on in the world, so... Um, okay. Oh, God. I've been holding off on so many tech improvements. I'm still going for the border growth. Okay, so... Um, I kind of have to found this city, otherwise the Assyrians are almost certainly going to take it out from under me. They already did. Curses! Well, I mean, maybe this is a good excuse to go to war. Currently they're stronger, but that just gives us an excuse to keep training. Your family line has a new heir, Duchess Belisunu. Training strong heirs is going to be vital for the survival of your nation once your current ruler is gone. Someone will need to take the reins. Once your heir has grown up a bit, you'll be able to choose an educational path to guide them into the role that you will need them to fulfill. The first four heirs in the succession are members of your court, and their ratings will affect your global yields. For example, an heir with high wisdom will increase your science. Duchess Belisunu is born. This is a day for celebration. All right, yeah, I, I feel really crummy about that, but... Um, the Tudor uh, mission of Cambyses, the minister, has led to an event. One day during lessons with their tutor, Kashaya hears a clamor beyond the palace walls. A group of urchins chase a terrified cat along the street, laughing and striking it with sticks. Cambyses notices uh, his pupil's interests and challenges her to intervene. What does the royal tutor advise? Attack the boys and drive them away? Distract the boys with a humorous story? 
wait until it's safe and nurse the cat back to health, or do nothing. Urchins will always chase cats. It's tempting to go for the extra wisdom, but uh, wait until it's safe and nurse the cat back to health will actually uh, undo the uh, distraction from the princess. So, um, Studies complete. Princess Kashaya has returned from her philosophy studies, but she would like to retain a tutor for additional training. What shall be the focus of her continuing education? She can spread knowledge to others or turn inwards in self-discovery. Like mother, like son. You have noticed that, for better or worse, Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi is showing signs of taking after his mother, Queen Consort uh, Amitis. How this, will inf how this influence will take shape is yet to be seen. <laughs> He's become slothful. Slothful bury their hand in the food dish, too lazy to bring the food to their mouth. Oh, bury their head. No, their hand in the food dish, too lazy to bring food to their mouth. And Duke Marduk uh, Nadin Ahi becomes robust. Okay, um, let's go for tactics for the second. And this is almost certainly a mistake, but... Court awaits your command. Shall we declare war on Assyria? Your orders will be carried out uh, by the court. But the court advises caution. The Assyrian army is likely stronger than ours, and we'll need good planning to overcome them on the battlefield. recommending a mine here again it's i don't disagree with the choice i just think um i'm i have a bad habit of using up too many of my potential urban districts um oh <laughs> They got me by surprise. Recent Persian wars have left King Cyrus, the explorer of Persia, with a severe need to re-equip his army before the next campaigning season begins. Iron, wood, food, and gold would be welcomely received. Uh, we can provide wood, or sadly, we have no position to give a... Oof, 200 wood. Sadly, we're in no position to give aid. A specialist can be recruited from the city screen by clicking the plus button on an improvement so long as you have an available citizen. Although improvements are already productive on their own, the specialist can boost their yields. Luxuries are special resources that allow you to uh, that you acquire by adding a rural specialist to an improvement on the correct tile. For example, you access gems by adding a minor specialist to a mine improvement, uh, mi sorry, mine improvement on the gems tile. Urban specialists like acolytes and officers can be trained to higher levels for further yield boosts. I'll recruit some specialists to boost my production. Okay, um, this is just going to be tricky all around, but the hope here is that I can out, um, that basically I can outdo this slinger, take out this militia, build a city, and be able to heal up before all hell breaks loose. You are the first to discover this landmark. What will you name it? The Thracian Sea. Mm, let's choose production first. So, I mean, we kind of need to get on, on with it as far as uh, the war is concerned, so... New slinger or warrior? Let's go for a warrior here. Um,
<laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar the Settler has tutored Princess Kashaya, improving her wisdom. Okay. This is recommending drama for... I mean, it's one of two options, right? We go for the Odeon or we go for the Shrine. Uh, actually, honestly, I think I want to do the Shrine more. As much as I like the music. Um, okay, we're sticking to the strategy. But... So if I go for the Hanging Gardens early, well, the culture's pretty good. There's a slightly better way I can do that. Oh, no, because I didn't see that before. Well, that's fine. Okay, one turn before uh, Settler on my way to what should be my last site, but... Good news! In a surprise piece of news, you receive an update from your soon, uh, son, Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi. Academy scholars respect him, and the other students complete, uh, compete to befriend him. At the moment, Marduk Nadin Ahi is thriving, encouraging him to focus on scholarship, or it's healthy for him to seek friends and fellowship. Uh, both tempting, um, but let's get him to follow scholarship. And Vanguard, uh, yeah, no problem. I'm... Um, I'm I'm already feeling kind of <laughs> woozy, so I I know I'm not at my my best. Have a have a good good night. I I hope it all turns out well. Turns out well for you. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm really nervous about my ability to withstand the. Oh no! Mises the minister has tutored Dirk Duke Marduk at Nadin Ahi, improving his charisma. Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi is plus one charisma. Okay, we gotta pull back. Ooh. This might get awkward. Okay, settlers are done. Um, let's get a replacement slinger set up. always want to take a quick look at what my possibilities are for expansion. We're pretty much always going to get Phantom Klepto. Thank you very much for the subscription. Sorry, there was something else I was going to say, and I completely forgot it, so... <laughs> um, thank you for that. I hope you're well. 
Um, man, I've really screwed this up. I don't think I can rush either. Yeah, I just need to wait and wait the turns. So I'm keeping this uh, scout here so I can... I, ba I basically can see if they're making a move, particularly if they're trying to move out with a... Um, with some kind of a a, um, a settler. Um... Actually, that wasn't a smart thing to, or er. Egypt has begun construction of the Hanging Gardens. Right, so I've I blew it. I I should have built it. All right, we'll go for the pasture. Um, so they want me to build a Mardu a shrine to Marduk here, but they want me to build the Oracle here. There are slightly smarter ways for me to do this. I will wind up building the... I did want to build the Hanging Gardens, but it actually just occurred to me that the Shrine of Marduk is a good choice here. Um... So I may be able to take advantage of mountains depending on these quarries. Trying to think about my immediate needs. Um, so I'm not crazy about creeping into my urban tiles, but we also haven't been making much use of the urban tiles lately, so. Uh, you still need to heal. Oh crap, I didn't I don't think I healed these guys last turn. Feel like healing in neutral territory is going to be very helpful for this unit. Inspired by nature, Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi has been sneaking off into the wild after class each day, growing ever more inspired by nature. What advice should we give to the spudding naturalist? Oak, myrrh, juniper, cedar, uh, acacia, uh, fig, date palm. Know them well. They become a naturalist. They uh, bonuses to lumber mills and pastures. Actually, this they'll be a very good governor. Uh, for that new city, so... Ah, actually, there's multiple... Hmm. Yeah, we'll make him a naturalist. It stopped storming here like three hours ago, but your power still keeps going out. You're fine. You... I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Sorry, I don't follow 5G uh, 160p. Oh, sorry, you're talking about um, you're talking about uh, resolutions. So is, is it just because the game is confusing, or, or like, sorry, I'm not doing a good job of explaining the game, or because of the. Uh, um... Uh, because of of what you're seeing, because I'm I'm happy to try and explain what's going on. I'm in my own head right now, and I really should uh, should get out of that. So, a delegation from Persia arrives with a marriage proposal for your daughter, Princess Kashaya. We should consider it carefully. Okay, I'm not opposed to marrying uh, the Persians. So, Kashaya is 23. We've got a 26 year old and a 31 year old. One's a hero with high courage. Dowry gives us three orders. Um, the other... Yeah. Bardia of... Uh, Art, uh, sorry, Articoana. Sounds like a good choice. 
Joyous wedding. The marriage of your heir, Princess Kashaya, to Prince Consort uh, Bardia brings the nation great joy. How shall we celebrate? We can keep it a small private affair, which um, more or less deals with our... Uh, it doesn't just deal with our um, our discipline issues, but it actually boosts it. We can invite the most prominent aristocrats. Now, I have been kind of ignoring my families. We're okay. Uh, or decree feasts through the cat. No, I, well, I want to go for the culture. Babylon has reached a new culture level. Higher levels of culture unlock additional improvements and wonders for your cities. Each new level will also trigger a positive culture event for the city. Today, a group of laborers has decided to, to join your workforce, granting you a new worker. Man, we've got more workers than what we know to do with, but I'm not going to complain about that because... Um, well, because I like having things. Still don't have husbandry. I guess we can move them off to the side here. Princess Kashaya, your daughter, and Prince Consort Berdia have given birth to a son, Duke Kurzigal, uh, sorry, Kurigalzu. So, uh, just as an, oh, sorry, uh, your wife, Queen Consort Amitis, wishes to indulge in her creative tendencies and decorate the palace with works of art. Shall we accommodate her? Uh, she becomes inspiring culture levels when she's a governor or it's to, no, we'll hire a skilled artist. An oath of support, oligarch Sin uh, Mubalat of Eridu and of the Chaldeans approaches with a proposition. King Nebuchadnezzar the settler, we have a unique chance to help each other. I understand that more troops may be needed for the war, but in return, I want an oath that you will help the Chaldeans should we ever ask for aid. The Chaldeans are offering some impressive spearmen and some of their finest chariots. Is it worth making a promise with unknown consequences, though? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Very well, I will swear this oath. Hurry production. Now that Babylon has reached the developing culture level, various options for hurrying production in the city have become available. With the developing or higher culture alone, a city can hurry production at the cost of some civics and discontent. Other methods of hurrying production are further enabled by certain governor traits or laws like orthodoxy and volunteers. These distinct means of hurrying production cost resources other than civics, although uh, they all produce discontent. For example, with holy war law and your state, a state religion, you can hurry production with money, and the patron's family class can always hurry production with money. You can see the different options for hurrying production in the city panel underneath the current production in progress. Hurrying production can be expensive, but can also save you in a tight spot. Okay. Um, there is a lot we can do with this. So, uh, The spearmen are the first polearm unit available to your nation. Polearm units excel at enemy mounted units. Only polearm units can exert a zone of control on mounted units. Spearmen also have a pierce attack, striking the unit behind their target for partial damage. Okay, so I may... Nope, looks like we can go to war right away. I was thinking of adding a general, but... Um, let's strike while the iron's hot. Your nation has trained its first mounted melee unit. These units move quickly and have the unique ability to rout your enemies, allowing you an additional attack if the first one destroys a unit. Okay, so we're definitely going to add some generals here. Oh, sorry. Attack cooldown. Okay, we might wipe these guys out first then. Still want to heal this unit. We're on better terms with Persia, but I still want to be a little cautious. Oligarch Sin Mubalat of Eridu approaches you late one evening in the gardens. I shall be brief, for it is a small matter, he says in a somber tone. I need you to return the favor, if possible. How shall we respond? Uh, we give up 180 stone uh, for the latest building project, or no, sadly, I'm unable to extend this uh, support at this time. 
How old is this guy? 33, okay. Um, that's a lot of stone, but we are also producing reasonably well. I mean, again, we took the, we took the money, so. Um, let's get the settlers on their way. This is a reasonably experienced unit, so here's what I'm gonna do. Let's, um, The only thing I don't like about this is that um, they get to counterattack, but still, like we're in a really good position to to do a heavy hit. So uh, the goal will actually be to complete. One of the goals that we have is to complete um, ten ambitions. So one of my ambitions was to uh, get four cities, which is one of the reasons I did this early war, even though I wasn't well prepared for it. So there's a few different things that you can do in the game, but in this case, uh, the specific the specific conditions under which this war is happening uh, is more more about trying to achieve certain objectives in the game. But yes, domination is definitely one of the victory options. Wow! What? Oh wait, no, I know where that came from. Now that Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi has completed his study of tactics, how shall he contribute to the court? Uh, he can become a zealot, or he can be a schemer. No, a zealot. Diplomacy through trade. Ambassador Amidas believes that she can further establish her diplomatic relations with the Persians through commerce and has drawn up plans for a trade mission to their capital. Shall we approve her plan to execute a trade deal? I would like to est help establish diplomatic relations through a trade mission. Uh, yeah, we get it for free. All right, so I wanted to take this with the settler. This is going to be hard because it's two sets of um, two sets of slingers that are really going to do a number on me. Okay. Um, Nope. Oh, right. Zone of control. Yeah, I don't think we die right away. I'm just, I'm trying to force him out of the position. Um, I'm mad I lost that chariot, though. I'm also mad that I didn't move my scout into into a position to claim that tile. All right, we're still waiting on this one. Uh... We're now known as Nebuchadnezzar the Enlightened. Babylonian paganism is founded in Babylon. Princess Kashaya, your daughter, never seems to sleep. Uh, sorry, uh, never seems to keep her word and is now known as deceitful. Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi uh, will do whatever it takes to get what he wants. He is ruthless. And Duchess Belasunu is now old enough to be tutored by courtiers. Okay, um, we can get roads from the labor force. Um, music from... Now I'm going to do drama. And Nebuchadnezzar is you and the governor of Babylon. Um, let's go... And become righteous. Okay, let's see if we can try and turn the tide. Cambyses' inspiring words have roused your armies to go above and beyond. Before battle, he prepares to speak to the troops. 
Every day we rise and fight to keep Babylonia safe. Once uh, more we are needed, and once more we will heed the call. Stand with me, my friends, and whatever happens. So hold formation and never surrender. Uh, fight with everything you have, or protect your comrades. Let's go for a healer. All right, uh, tutoring for sure, and we have new laws. So you can go for centralization, um, or vassalage. I usually wind up going with centralization. It's a big stack of civics we gave up for that, but I don't think it's worth it. Okay, uh, I think we probably still want to keep um, throwing out military units until further notice. Um... Uh, warrior selected. The warrior is the first melee, melee unit available in your uh, to your nation. Melee units will form the backbone of your army, defending you from enemy tribes and nations. I will use warriors for early combat. All right. And I think we probably just go straight for the warrior again. Pagan religions are founded by building your first shrine, and they spread by building more shrines. They have no disciples, theologies, or access to special religious improvements, but improving the religion's opinion will reduce discontent in cities with the religion. Paganism can be adopted as a state religion if you enact divine rule. I will build more shrines if I want to spread paganism. Battle in the skies. Reports abound of the strangest sightings in the sky above Eridu. At daybreak, two red arcs uh, appeared in the sun, followed by blood-red orbs and a variety of rods across the, the sky. The many shapes started fighting among themselves, flying back and forth for no less than an hour. As the sun grew stronger, the strange shapes burned bright and then faded away, and lastly, a large black spear drifted across the sky. Unbelievable as it sounds, the event was witnessed by many in Eridu, and there is a concern that something of great significance has come to pass. Fifteen sixty one celestial phenomena over Nuremberg. <laughs> A mass sighting of celestial phenomena, or unidentified flying objects, occurred in 1561 above Nuremberg, then a free imperial city of the Holy Roman Empire. This view is mostly dismissed by skeptics, uh, some referencing Carl Jung's mid-20th century writings about the subject, while others find the phenomena to be, uh, is likely to be a sun dog. A broadsheet news article printed in April 1561 describes a mass sighting of celestial phenomena. The broadsheet, illustrated by a woodcut engraving and text by Hans Glasser, measures 26.2 centimeters uh, by 38 centimeters. The document is archived in the Prints and Drawings collection at the Zentralbibliothek Zurich in Zurich, Switzerland. According to the broadsheet, around dawn on the 14th of April, 1561, many men and women of Nuremberg saw what the broadsheet describes as an aerial battle out of the sun, followed by the appearance of a large black triangular object and exhausted combatant spheres falling to earth in clouds of smoke. The broadsheet claims that witnesses observed hundreds of spheres, cylinders, and other odd-shaped odd -shaped objects that moved erratically overhead. The woodcut illustration depicts objects of various shapes, including crosses, one second, <coughs> with or without spheres on the arms, small spheres, two large crescents, a black spear, and cylindrical objects from which several small spheres emerged and darted across the sky at dawn. I'm going to skip the text over here, but um, sorry, one second. <coughs> ah, sorry. According to author Jason uh, Colavito, the woodcut broadsheet became known in modern culture after being published in Carl Jung's 1958 book, Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Skies, a book which analyzed the archetypal meanings of UFOs. Young expressed a view that the spectacle was most likely a natural phenomenon with religious and military interpretations overlying it. If the UFOs were living organisms, one would think a swarm of insects rising with the sun, not to fight one another, but to mate and celebrate the marriage flight. A military interpretation would view the tubes as cannons and spheres as cannonballs, emphasize the black spearhead at the bottom of the scene, and Glass's own testimony that the globes fought vehemently until exhausted. 
A religious view would emphasize the crosses. Jung thinks that the images of four globes cu uh, coupled by line suggests crossed marriage uh, uh, quadrant? Uh, and forms the model of the primitive cross uh, cousin marriage. He also posited that it could also be an individuation symbol and the association of sunrise suggests the revelation of the light. On Good Friday, 1554, another siege happened and one broadsheet publisher described mock suns that prog prognosticated God's will uh, wanted confession of sinful ways, i.e. the victims brought it on themselves. Another sky apparition followed in July of knights fighting each other with fiery swords thus warning a coming day of judgment. Very similar appar uh, apparitions of knights uh, fighting in the skies were frequently reported during the Thirty Years' War. Many similar broadsheets of wondrous signs exist in German and Swiss archives, and Nuremberg seems to be the focus of a number of them, presumably because of the hardships and conflicts of the ex-prosperous. Uh, Such conditions typically accentuate apocalyptic thought. Just one moment. Okay. Uh, so the sign uh, to redouble our efforts against Assyria to arms, uh, that'll get me a militia. Um, there's nothing to fear as long as I am obeyed. I will protect Eridu as I protect everyone. <laughs> um, bonus, there's a big, big batch of discontent, um, but I get legitimacy. Or what a fascinating insight into rare natural phenomena. More study is needed. So I'm a little tempted about the militia, but I don't use the militia that much. So let's just go, we'll go for the science. All right. Duchess Pelissunu, um, let's go for commerce here. And we're out of order. So Phantom Klepto, again, I'm trying to be a little bit better at the um, at describing what's going on. There's a few things that make this game unique to uh, compared to other sort of 4X uh, turn-based strategy games. Uh, one is the order system. So there's a limited number of things that you can do in a given turn um, based on orders. The other thing that's pretty unique about this is... Um, well, I sorry, the, the distance is, is not as unique. But like basically, there's a bit of a balance that you need to strike in terms of your um, sort of your army actions and your civics actions. And your legitimacy will actually be something that determines whether or not you can, you can sort of pull it off. Okay, we, um, we got what we needed. The question is, do I want to try and push my advantage and take one of their cities? Uh, Kashtilash the Greedy has converted to Babylonian paganism. Uh, Princess Kashaya has been overcome by fear and has lost one courage. And Ninsunu the Younger has converted to Babylonian paganism. Although Babylonia has no state religion, many people uh, follow their own faiths and practices. The Babylonian pagan priests of Babylon say that the support of the gods will only strengthen your rule and offer to teach you about their ways. Will you accept? Yes, I will convert to Babylonian paganism. Okay, I definitely want to found the city. So the question is, which of the families do I... Ah, oh, good, Vanguard Master. I'm glad you got through your work. So... Uh, we have one more city, uh, sorry, one more family seat to found. I could go for the uh, the Eason seat. Now, I haven't quite, excuse me, I haven't used the caravan enough to find it, um, to find it helpful, whereas the sages, you know, the extra civics, the extra science, definitely a, a big bonus here. This is really just so that I can, you know, I can get my third and then be able to build another another city on the city site. So we'll start with the Amorite sages. We've got Polis. Now the nice thing here is I can heal um, my units. So 
So again, I have a few options. One, I can try and go after their slingers, or two, we actually try and take the city. Uh, now that that's going to be a costly attack, um, but we do have kind of a group of people who I think we would be able to sort of pull it off. Uh, thought this power outage killed your switch, but the dock is just the crappy. <laughs> we had a little bit of thunder on my way home, but it wasn't quite King Lear weather, so I wasn't too worried about it. All right, I'm going to build the uh, Chaldean city just because they get bonuses for mines and lumber mills. Obviously, there's two gems here, so this is a big, big potential bonus for me. And it completes the um, it completes the ambition that I had. So that's going to give me additional legitimacy. That's also going to improve the number of orders that I get a turn. So that means I'm just going to be able to do more. Uh, also, it's a great excuse for me to start using my workers. Okay, on that note, um, I do think there's some logic in building a farm, but I don't know if there's logic in building a farm on the hill here. So I'm going to settle settle for a... I'm going to settle for nothing! So the Shrine of Nabu gets um, bonuses for adjacent Odians. So it would seem to make sense to sort of put them here. Okay. Um, and there is a question in terms of what I want to build in this city. Walls actually wouldn't be a terrible choice here. And in Larsa, I think we should probably work. It, it's going to take forever for this war, uh, warrior to get built, but honestly, like until we're, well, it looks like we're actually pretty strong already, but I, I definitely want to be kind of bear, like bearing down on people as much as I can. All right, Patriarch uh, Kashtilash the Greedy is now head of Babylonian paganism. Our ambassador uh, Amitas failed to complete her mission to establish a trade network in Persian. The Persians are not happy with us and will only accept a gift instead. Um, will not be extorted. Oh, God. Um, food boost, free settler, or nothing. I'm going to take the free settler. Amitas is your wife and my ambassador. Um, more wisdom. Okay, I definitely want to start putting some investment in my uh, in my infrastructure. So, okay, we don't have the stone for the shrine of Nabu. We also don't have the stone for the Odium. <laughs> but uh, it looks like there's a oh no that's the same warrior I think this is a time I'm willing to pay up this is probably going to wind up in combat sooner rather than later Number lists. Number lists are used to work on complex calculations. The tablets can give the answers to common problems. Belisunu has impressed her tutors by working on calculations not previously recorded and finding the exact amount for divisions that do not come out evenly. So very impressive, or aren't there more practical skills? No, we will always go for more science. Oh, I've never tried Undertale. Are you enjoying it, uh, Phantom Klepto? Family Ambitions, a dis distinguished am emissary from the Amorites, 
and a poetess of the Cassites have each made a request of the court, asking for you to show uh, to support their family. The Amorite family are in favor of your rule and eager for your support, while the Cassite family are pleased by your recent actions and are looking to strengthen their ties to your noble house. Will you start an ambition to try and curry favor with one of these noble houses? So support the Amorites for six urban improvements or um, the Cassites for five unit promotions. Both tempting. Um, let's go control six urban improvements because that'll give me a good excuse to, to actually do that. Neighbors, your scouts report that you, they have made contact with a neighboring nation, the Egyptians. What is our demeanor as you approach them? I think we just lost something. Yeah, God. I really need to learn how to do combat better. Um, not crazy about the fact that the game covered up all that action, though. Your scouts report that they have made contact with a neighboring nation, the Egyptian... Uh, sorry, um, humble speak a uh, little of our own people, asking many questions. Um, friendly, we trade news about our people for information about theirs. And prideful. Too friendly. All right. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar the Enlightened has tutored Duchess Belisunu, improving her charisma. Uh, deeply affectionate and prone to passionate gestures, uh, Princess, Princess Kashaya, your daughter and my heir, is a hopeless romantic. Okay, so... The game's certainly been quite successful at putting the hurt on me uh, by focusing on my characters. Thing is, I don't think I'm going to be able to seal the deal with, uh, with this warrior. Well, here's what we're going to do. Poke him with something sharp. Hmm, yeah, there's possibilities here. So this will drive them off, but we can probably follow up with... Wait a minute. They've got a counterattack, don't they? My god. Ugh, it's still going to sting, though. Um... Yeah, I think I'm going to wind up losing another unit out of this. doing there. I didn't have enough orders for... Well, let's do Fallen Batter. After the fighting is done, one of the few survivors under oligarch Tabni Ishtar of Babylon slink back to their capital. They bring reports that their banner was lost in the battle, despite Tabni Ishtar surviving. General Cambyses, the minister, strict even for a general, demands that uh, Tabini Ishtar should be publicly denounced for letting the banner fall, but the defeated leader was carried from the battle after an early arrow pierced her armor. So we can berate her for allowing her banner to fall, or encourage Tabni Ishtar that she will have a chance to redeem herself. Um, yeah, I'll let my minister be disappointed. I can live with that. Okay, um, that's tempting. I, I just... I really just don't want someone to die this coming turn. Yeah, man. Oh, okay. Uh, you've met your first tribe, the Numidians. Tribes can engage in limited diplomacy, but generally won't be coordinated in a way opposing nations are. Uh, you may find by bar barbarians when exploring the map. You do not behave like tribes, uh, as you are always at war with them. Barbarians are good targets for early expansion, as they are easier to drive away than a more organized tribe. 
Finding some barbarians or a weak tribe and claiming their city sites for yourself will be an important step towards growing your nation. I will carefully consider my approach to tribes like the Numidians. Okay. Um. Hmm. This game's recommending military drill. I can see the logic behind that because I've been wanting to build barracks and that's in line with my goal of... It's also in line with my goal of... Uh, um, sorry, it's in line with my goal of... Um, getting all those urban improvements. Okay, so I gotta pull my warrior out. The big question here is, am I gonna be able to seal the deal on the... Oh, I think I might... Ruthless slaughter. Troops led by General Cambyses the minister have prevailed in battle, but the scene was a horrible one. As Assyrian soldiers were routed and retreating in disarray, Cambyses led the charge to kill the panicking enemy. He was seen personally executing a group of Assyrians that tried to surrender. Tales of this brutal slaughter have reached Assyria through one of the few survivors, and the Assyrians are so discouraged by this display of the savagery of war that they're willing to commit to an immediate truce. Um... Hmm. This is what we needed to press on against Assyria, or we can have honor even in war. My troops will not act like barbarians. Hmm. So, ah, this is a tough one, because, like, we do sort of have them on the back foot. I wouldn't be surprised... Oh, no, we can still survive this. So, we are actually in a position where we might be able to to make some progress on there. Uh, this is what we need to press against Assyria. I may come to regret this, but... I've discovered the Zagros Mountains. Boastful air. The royal family of Persia visits the court. During a feast, Prince Darius of Persia makes a shocking boast about how much better a ruler he will be one day. King Cyrus the Intrepid of Persia chides him for his brashness and turns to us for support. Um, King Cyrus is already pretty mad at me. Without a doubt, Cyrus is a laughing stock. <laughs> the citizens of Eridu trust in our justice and leadership. As a result, city leaders wish to strengthen the legal system and encourage more people to participate in the judicial process. They are considering the formation of a mis, uh, misloph sorry, misthophoria, a paid function that provides jurors with a salary. Such a position would be costly, but it would make Eridu's courts second to none. So we can establish one... Um, Hmm. It's expensive. It'll actually... Not only will it close my treasury down, but it'll actually probably uh, push me over the edge into a deficit. We could require mandatory um, jury service, or we could stay out of the legal system. Um, nah, let's do the investment. I definitely need to find a way to make money, though. Okay, let's see what horrible things await us next turn. Interesting. Princess Keshaya, your daughter, and Prince Consort uh, Berdaya have given birth to a daughter, Duchess uh, Demkitum. Pay to play. You are surprised to find that Patriarch uh, Kashtilash the Greedy has been spending a lot of time with Belasunu, running errands and even doing work for the child. Upon further investigation, you find that the clever young Belasunu has been making use of her commercial knowledge from her recent studies, and access to the royal coffers, of course, to exploit Kadashash's uh, greedy nature. Belasunu has been bribing uh, Kashtilash uh, into being her servant. This is impressive strategic. Is this impressive uh, strategic thinking, or simply an abuse of power? 
So skills like these will serve you well and becomes corrupt or you can't rely on money to grant you power. I gotta, gotta go for the piety. Okay. Um, hmm. I think this is worth force marching. Ah, now we don't get to keep the we don't get to keep the unit. We just just heard it. Okay. Uh, honestly, I don't think it's worth the trouble then. I'm a little worried about the survivability of this slinger, but we'll see what the next turn brings. Um, I guess it's time for me to actually start building some of this stuff, huh? the stone for a garrison but it's at least in the plans I think this will have to be where I put my barracks okay let's see what happens That's not a huge surprise, although it seemed to have taken damage inexplicably. Hanging Book Gardens is completed by Egypt. King Nebuchadnezzar the Enlightened is tutored Belisunu, improving your charisma. To the court's surprise, a marriage proposal has arrived from the Numidians. Your son, Duke Marduk, Nadin, Ahi the Robust, and Tihanian the Numidian. We can ring the bells, but I think we lose legitimacy. No, nope, not at this time. A huddle of diplomats arrives from Egypt. Their leader steps before the court and makes a dire declaration. Set has cast a shadow over your people, and he is a ruthless god. We can beseech the god Osiris, who is Set's brother, to grant you favor and erase this shadow. Uh, we can't afford it, and we will refuse their help. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we've got... Yeah, we've already got two uh, Chaldean sites so um we do have fur so that's something i could i could justify a cassite um city with okay um keep hurting the bad guys i don't see any way that we're gonna we're going to be effective here, so... Um, so, I would prefer not to be spending stones on slingers, but we need a big army. So unless we wind up being, so it says weaker, but un until we see like the big difference between the two, I think I want to keep, uh, I think I want to keep going for my, um, my troops. Uh, on that note, warrior it is.
So I want to um, start clearing out the fog of war just so I have another path to Gozen. Interesting. How on earth did they survive that? You are now known as Nebuchadnezzar the Wise. The oracle is completed by Babylonia, General Ishtar Gamalat. General the warrior has died in the field, and Duke Kurza Glazu is now old enough to be tutored by courtiers. Oh, hang on. I think that was the, uh, the general ability. Shouts from the trees. Our men hurry towards the noise and discover an injured Carthaginian lying in the dirt. His companions work frantically to treat his wounds. According to the men, their caravan was transporting goods to the nearest Carthaginian city when they were attacked by bandits. They managed to repel the attackers and save the cargo of fine wine. So we can treat his wounds and escort the caravan to its de destination, negotiate an exchange of protection for goods, or kill the Carthaginians and steal their cargo. Uh, tempting, and I mean, we are presumably, yeah. We could presumably kind of throw our weight around a bit, but let's do the exchange. Um, I kind of think lumber mill is more or less a must-have at this point, so let's do forestry. Don't have the stone for the garrison. Okay, so what I want to do here, I definitely want to try and heal up my, um, my slinger, so. And, uh, what was it? Yeah, unit cannot die with greater than one HP. So I have a couple of advantages here. Um, I'm going to be able to kill off this unit. Just, like, without any real effort. The other thing that's nice is we actually get to trap this unit. So even though they do a fair amount of damage... They can't kill anyone, and I don't see a situation where they can get out of this. Uh, I'm not sure what we'll do with this unit yet. Okay, I'm still gonna keep pumping out warriors. The Oracle, it is done. To pagan Babylonians, the Oracle of Babylon is the center of the world. The temple area is built on the slopes of a sacred mountain, the site where they believe a, a god slew the gargantuan snake Python. Now priestesses, the Pythia, inhale smoke and divine prophecies from their god, answering the questions of supplicants. The sacred way that leads up the mountain is adorned with displays of art and wealth as the families compete to show their dedication and wealth. The sacred site will stand as a testament to our people for all time, a symbol of our accomplishments today and of the glories yet to come. With this wonder, my legacy will endure. Um, let's get another tactician. I figure we can probably go for the... Uh, I think I wanted the barracks here, didn't I? Yeah, but I don't have the stone for it. So clearly we need more stone. So, um, once we've taken out this unit, I'm assuming that the Assyrians haven't been idle, that they're going to be uh, developing more units. But at this point, I'm going to want to see what we can do to Gozen. Um, in the worst case, I need to kind of head back and heal my units. Yeah, of course they get a crit. An assignment. A uh, letter arrives by courtier from Belisunu at the Academy. Dear Nebuchadnezzar, as part of the, my instruction in the Academy, my tutors have directed me to write to you. All has been going well, and I have, a, I have little to complain of. I miss mother at times, but I must carry on. Your daughter, Belisunu. Thank you. Please return to your duties, duties courier. You and your daughter Belisunu uh, entertain visiting dignitaries from Carthage. An argument breaks out. The visitors accuse you of installing spies in their court. The claims are false, of course, but your reaction will set a strong example for the young Belisunu. 
throw them out of the court, and she becomes bold, uh, convince them of their mistake, we become eloquent, or turn them against each other, we become uh, cunning, uh, tempting, but let's convince them of their mistake. Commerce studies. Now that Belisunu has completed her study of commerce, how shall she contribute to the court? Uh, she can be an orator. Um, hmm. Or a builder. Let's go for orator. Embracing change. Your people, like all people, have traditions, established ways of doing things. Unfortunately, the way it's always been done isn't always the best or the most efficient. As you've continued to establish yourself in these new lands, you've been watching the way the Numidians go about their business of harvesting food from the ground, from animals, and extracting metals from the earth. Their methods are somewhat different from yours, and frankly better. It occurred to you that you could convince the tribal elders to allow your people to study their methods. You could create a series of hybrid techniques that give you the best of both worlds and, uh, and made all your mines, farms, and pastures more productive on the whole. It took some doing, but you finally convinced King uh, Hem Hem sorry, Hemsal uh, to send some of his peoples to your land so they can, that you can learn from them. Paying for their upkeep will be a daunting expense, but in the long run, the project could pay handsome dividends. What say you? Um, eight pastures, camps, groves, or nets. We've got four already, and as attractive as it sounds. Yeah, no, let's go for it. Uh, because we can build a net here, so that's five. In fact, let's start that right now. Thesis is the general, the spearman, and a court minister. Um, discipline's tempting, but let's go for bloodthirsty. That also seems in character. All right. Um, let's keep tutoring. Uh, one more action. Okay, so yeah, we still want to make uh, slow progress in Gozen, but um, I don't really have any siege weapons, so it's going to take a while. Assyria is now at truce with the Numidians. Princess Kashaya has converted to Babylonian paganism. A delegation from Carthage arrives with a marriage proposal for your son, Duke Marduk Nadin Ahi the Robust. Um, so we've got a 30 and a 28-year-old for my 28-year-old. Very high wisdom, um, but reductions on charisma and courage. Dowry gives us iron. Alternatively, we have the younger scholar, wisdom, charisma, courage, dowry of five civics. I don't know, I kind of feel like another scholar is not... It's just one of those things I kind of want. Okay. Um. Aha. So it doesn't seem to be that there's that big of a difference uh, in terms of the damage to the city. Um, I thought I had somebody who could heal in friendly territory, but apparently not. So this slinger doesn't have much of a chance if they're on their own, but we'll see where it goes. Okay, I've got eight um, 
eight actions that I can take. Say eight orders. Most of which is going to be spent moving my people, I think. Do I keep pushing on characters? The miner's kind of tempting because of the money. No, I think we keep. I think we keep pushing people that we need in. And I have enough money for a bear. Well, I have enough money, but I don't have enough actions. So I will build an Odie in there at some point, but I'm not quite ready for one. I'm curious if this warrior is going to come out. Interesting. A mild fever and a runny nose. King Nebuchadnezzar the Wise, you, governor of Babylon, is ill. Queen Consort Amidas has converted to Babylonian paganism. Prince of Larsa. How much is Larsa worth? A group of Persian diplomats have arrived, offering to form an alliance or enter war with Assyria if you'd be willing to give up the city. What answer will you give to Cyrus's emissaries? Uh, we could agree to trade Larsa for an alliance, trade the city for help in the war, or decline the diplomatic offer. Yeah, I don't want to give up... <laughs> I want to give up my city. Okay, um, so I want to. I want my. I want two Odians here. Um, I will consider two barracks, but the, I'm going to start with the barracks here, um, just because I get the bonus beside the garrison. Moving right along. Um, let's start by throwing rocks at the warrior. We're not quite close enough to do something to the. Uh, to the warriors, so I'm going to move my other warriors in. We'll heal who we can. And we don't have any free generals, so that doesn't really mean that much. Okay. Um, Assyria counts as much weaker, which is good. Persia also counts as much weaker, so I think if anything, they were just trying to get paid to go after somebody who they'd have an advantage against. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be building the Great Ziggurat anytime soon. I was not expecting two sets of warriors. Our doctors and diviners have warned you that the end is near. Time to get your affairs in order. Nebuchadnezzar the Wise has tutored Prince Kuriglazu, uh, improving his wisdom. Okay, so this is a bit of a trouble for me because I think we get less ambition for the um, for the old ones. But. No cutting child for you? You don't want to worry about knives and spots? Yeah, well, apparently it doesn't matter because I'm, uh, I'm about to croak. I was really young. Duke Marduk Nadin Abi Ahi the Robust has an illegitimate son, Lutpri. Pincer attack. In tactic studies, Kurzag Glazu inadvertently started a rivalry among your best generals. Upon loudly asking you if you could, he could train with the best general, uh, Bernard Berbiesh and Marduk Nadin Ahi both overheard and assumed that he meant them. The two generals approach, catching you in a veritable pincer maneuver. Uh, Bernard Berbiesh from the left and Marduk Nadin Ahi from the right. Kurzaglazu recognizes the danger and watches for your lead. Um, so cautious. They're both going to be bad. We'll focus on the left flank 
In times of war like these, the troops like to hear encouragement from their leader, a rousing speech from you uh, on the glories of Babylonia and the unmatched courage of her fighting men in, would improve morale. You can conduct a rally troops mission uh, by clicking the rally button in the action panel on the left while your leader is selected. Rally troops missions give you the chance to gain some training at the cost of a few orders and some civics. They may also lead to follow-up events. Will you go out on a rally troops mission? Uh, so this is a freebie because of the tutorial. Oh god, alright. One last time, the Egyptian diplomats return. Their leader glowers. You refuse to make donations to the gods of Egypt, who wished only to restrain their evil brother Set. Now you will learn the extent of Set's lust for blood as he rains destruction upon your cities. Uh, how shall we respond to this threat? We could say we will defend ourselves from all enemies or execute the di diplomats from Egypt. Um, execute the diplomats. <laughs> I don't even know where the Egyptians are, so this might get interesting. This was for the Odeon, so... Um, well, that's a recipe for this unit getting killed. Uh, wait a minute, they have the... Mm. I'm trying to think of the best way to use this unit without... So, like, if I completely run, then it seems like this unit can come in after my warrior. I mean, this guy's going to be hurting either way. Um, I get a bonus attacking from Urban, but again, we're just not enough to do anything to Gozen. So if I Force Marched... Okay, yeah, uh, then I buy up the, the orders. That's a free kill. Okay, well, no, that's actually a very costly kill. Ah! It's the counterattacks that get me every time. Fortify seems like a weird choice, but I want to make it costly for them to come after me. Oh god, yeah, I really... I really need to get my orders under control. Oh, <laughs> found the Egyptians. Oh, 
And we wound up losing the warrior anyway. Following ambitions are now legacies. Control six urban improvements, control eight pastures, camps, groves, or nets. Okay. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar the Wise has died in office. Uh, we'll take the freebie as usual. Choose a new governor. So normally I put the ruler um, in the position, but let's see if there's anybody. Well, honestly, everybody's kind of got a... Everybody has a negative feature, so... Okay, let's get that Odeon built. Let's get some revenge. A battlefield duel! News of the battle reaches Babylon before the week is out. Reports say that it was a clash of minds unlike anything seen before. Each general wielding their knowledge of tactical maneuvers in a duel of minds. The fight was decided with a final ploy in which Berna uh, Buriash faked the retreat of his troops whilst keeping them organized enough to reform at a moment's notice. As the enemy rushed forwards, the Babylonian units pulled back together and decimated the enemy forces. So we can praise his genius. Uh, or praise his forces discipline. No, we'll praise his genius. Okay, so that's opened up Gozen for us, at least until there's more military units in the region. Ah, what do I do with the rest of this? Okay, um, I want an Odeon if I can, but looks like that's not an option. Definitely want to put more troops in the area, although I am going to have to deal with the Egyptians at some point. Um, probably moving the Slingers isn't a bad idea. Alright. Um, I think we just keep cranking out the the, um, the military units. In this time of war, the loss of King Nebuchadnezzar the Wise hits the nation especially hard. Let us hope Kashaya, new queen of Babylonia, can be a beacon of hope for our people in the dark times ahead. Long live Queen Kashaya the New. Like father, like daughter, a trusted advisor informs you that, for better or worse, Duchess uh, Damic, uh, Damic, Damicton uh, is showing signs of taking after her father, King Consort uh, Bardaya. How this influence will take shape is yet to be seen. <laughs> they become foolish. Your leader, Queen Kashaya the New, is a schemer archetype. With a schemer leader, you can adop uh, conduct adopt-child missions uh, and buy orders with legitimacy. They can also get plus two orders per year uh, per war, and their scouts are invisible. I'll make the best use of my leader based on their archetype. Uh, tutorial, take the field. A character can be assigned as a general to a unit, contributing to their unique bonuses to a unit. Assign a general by selecting the unit and then clicking add the general uh, button along the action panel on the left. A general, with the exception of the leader, cannot be from a different family from that of the unit. Our spearman unit has been hard at work training for battle and they are ready for leadership. Will you take the role of a general and lead them? Uh, no. <laughs> I am needed in the capital. An age of war. The people of Babylonia are tired. The multiple wars have families, supplies, and patience stretched thin. Discontent is on the rise, with the people of Babylon marching through the streets in mobs. Members of your court have gathered to suggest that a plan is needed to encourage the people and restore their spirits, before you are faced with rebels at home as well as abroad. So we can stockpile food uh, to supply both our troops and citizens. Um, yeah, produce a thousand food seems pretty easy. Specialists will allow the flow of trade to continue even in war. Now that's going to cut off our source of troops. So I'm not crazy about that or will not be defined by the time. So honestly, food seems like a manageable ambition. Okay, we just made a slinger. Um, we don't have the stone for a new slinger. So let's go for a warrior. And that's it for the turn. So I apologize for the slightly more... Um, I don't know, like, I kind of feel like I just 
read the words for the game out and I didn't really offer a whole lot on my own. But honestly, I'm not even finishing that. <laughs> I'm not even finishing that early uh, for a night tonight. I'm I'm actually feeling quite tired and I really liked playing this. But um, I think I got to wrap it up here. And it's not a bad time because we uh, turned over with Nebuchadnezzar. The one thing that worries me a little bit here is that Yes, I'm doing better in the war. Um, I've definitely lost some troops, and it's at a considerably easier difficulty than I've normally played. So it's hard to say that I've really learned the lessons. Um, I'll do my best with what I've got, right? Like, we'll see whether or not we can take Gozen. I'm not in a rush to, like, wipe out uh, Ashurbanipal. So, you know, if I have a chance to you know, to make peace and focus on the Egyptians so much the better. I mean, I suppose with Assyria, like, we we do have an advantage. So if I can push that advantage, you know, so much the better. But um, clearly I've put a lot of effort on this side of the map and I am going to need to protect uh, Eridu and, and such. Um, so yeah, we'll see whether or not I can, you know, I can sort of pull off um, some better some better strategies. But I don't know, I don't think it hurts to to get back, uh, I don't know, back to basics. I, I definitely feel like there's quite a bit more militarily that I can I can learn to, to benefit from. There's definitely some stuff that I think I did better with, uh, like being able to catch the, the enemy unit on both sides so that zone of control would keep them from being able to escape. I think that was, that was a pretty good uh, maneuver there. But yeah, I definitely feel like I can still do a little bit better as time goes by, but I actually have a bunch of work that I need to do, and I honestly don't know if I'm going to be able to get through it just because of the... Um, I'm just feeling really, really tired. Yeah, it's definitely to the game's benefit. I mean, the only thing that makes me a little worried is that um, normally games where I'm learning, I feel like I do a much better job of explaining, and I'm not entirely sure I did that tonight. So, I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, I don't really have that many people I can host tonight, so I think I'm just gonna end it there. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, I don't know. I'm sorry this wasn't a better stream. <laughs> um, I will, um, so there's a few uh, a few things coming up. So um, I've got um, uh, Wednesday we'll be back with Phantom Brigade. Friday we will um, uh, sorry Friday we will be back uh, probably without there, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that yet. Next week, um, I believe it's Labor Day on Monday, so I'll probably take that day for myself. It's one of the reasons why I... I don't know, it's one of the reasons why I put... Uh, I, I kind of wanted to put a little more effort into uh, streaming streaming tonight. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I really feel like I should take next week off. Because um, I'm, I'm definitely going to be running hot uh, work-wise for the next, uh, the next little while. Um, but yeah, until then, I'm sorry it wasn't better. Um, so, uh, but one way or the other, uh, I will see you Wednesday or a couple weeks from now if you're just here for, uh, Old World. And, uh, I hope you all have a good time until then. Take care. And thank you, Cree. <laughs>